Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. Wild Karen demands to use my wheelchair in the antique store. After that, try to steal my illegally rented parking spot? Enjoy getting fired. And after that, am I the jerk for interrupting my son's date, asking him to pick up his little sister? Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen does not get to take anyone's wheelchair. The only thing I want to take is a break from being in here with you all day, Reddit boy. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Wild Karen demands to use my wheelchair in the antique store. Cast, we've got me, we've got Nails, an old man, though he doesn't speak, and we've got Harriet, Karen. My husband and I rent a display space in an antique slash consignment store for our collective side hustles. I quilt and crochet. My husband sells custom die cast cars and diorama supplies. Every few weeks we go in and restock our space. The store is very large and can be a bit of a maze and the store has designated rest stops throughout the aisles. One is across from our space. The store does not provide mobility aids for customers, so it is a bring your own policy if you need a walker or a wheelchair. I'm a wheelchair user as I'm paralyzed. My husband and I were at the store restocking the space. My husband had just left to take one of our totes out to the van, leaving me in our space sorting through one of my tote bags. When I hear someone huffing behind me, I don't really pay too much attention to it, thinking that someone might have been taking a break at the rest stop. I was just finishing laying out my sets on the table in our space when the person at the rest stop decided to talk to me. Do you know if the store has wheelchairs for people to use? I look up from my task and I see an elderly couple across from our space. The old man is standing next to the bench looking kind of annoyed while the woman has flopped on the bench in an I can't take another step kind of way. I honestly was concerned that she might have been having a medical issue as she was rather plump. Are you okay? I ask about to tell her or her partner to use the phone above the bench to reach the staff desk for help. This store is too big, Harriet exclaims. I can't walk anymore. Me. The store has a chair for medevac use. One of the employees can bring it out to you if you need help leaving. Harriet. But we're not done shopping. Me. I don't think they have wheelchairs to borrow. They've had issues with rowdy kids riding mobility scooters, so they don't provide them anymore. But if you use the phone above you, you can ask a staff member. Just dial 1 and it will connect you to the staff desk. There's a sign next to the phone that states this. Harriet seems to be thinking about her options, so I go on about my work. Nels wanders down the aisle, possibly looking for an escape route. Harriet. What about the wheelchair you're sitting in? Me. This is my personal wheelchair. It doesn't belong to the store. Can I borrow it? What? Surely she's not asking to take my chair to go shopping. Harriet. I want to use the wheelchair. You're young enough that you can stand to walk for a bit. I'll bring it back. Me. Ma'am, I cannot stand at all. I've been a paraplegic since I was 12. This wheelchair is not store issued. It's my personal property and it costs a lot of money. If you call the staff, maybe they can let you use the medical chair. Or maybe they know of one someone has in their space that you can buy but I will not give you my chair and I cannot help you. At this point, I've rolled out of our space. I decided to head towards the vendor door and just leave. Rumor has it, Harriet is still sitting on the bench waiting for someone to give her a wheelchair. Try to steal my legally rented parking spot? Enjoy getting fired. I'm a professional driver. As such, on the roads in the US, there are different truck stops throughout the country that has a pay to park system usually about 10 to 20% of the lot marked off as reserved, with each space running from $15 to $25. The truck stop where this took place had parking for $17, which is relatively cheap for a guaranteed spot. The spots are reserved for 24 hours, starting at 4 p.m. local time and extending to 3 p.m. the following afternoon. I knew that I would have a late night delivery, so I came to the truck stop around 3.30 and paid for a reserved spot. I told the manager on duty that I had a delivery up the road that night and would be back once delivery was completed, but should still be able to clear out the spot by the next afternoon, today. She told me that this was okay and she would mark the spot as sold when I left. That way, if someone else comes in trying to reserve that spot, she could consult her notes and deny the sale. 11.15pm rolls around. I take off for my delivery. 
I don't get out of that facility until 2.30 a.m. the next morning, this morning. So I groggily drive back to the truck stop to reclaim my paid-for spot, only to find that the reserved parking spaces are all full. I call the manager on duty and after giving her my info, inform her that all of the spots are full and that someone has parked in a spot and hasn't paid for it. She sends her other employee out to start checking trucks. The culprit was from a company that is known for their bright orange trailers and he was a company driver. The other employee starts banging on his door to inform him that he's parked illegally and he has to move. Meanwhile, I can see the commotion from my mirror with my vantage point in the fuel island where I had been instructed to temporarily park. The driver answers the door with a bottle of Heineken in one hand and some sort of smoking implement in another. I know what it is, but for the sake of the mods, I'm not going to say it. I decided to roll down the window to hear the commotion and I hear the employee tell the driver to either move or he will get the towing company and police involved. This driver is flat out irate that someone had the audacity to tell him where he can and cannot park, so he slams the door on the employee, threatening him. Employee calls the police and the tow company, and the police show up first. I had worked for this company before, so I know their policies, and more importantly, what they can and cannot have in their trucks. Alcoholic beverages are not allowed in the cab. Anything that isn't a cigarette or a cigar in a lighter, also not allowed. The coup de grace, a pew pew of any kind, absolutely not allowed, and absolutely not loaded. This driver had all of that and some other not so legal substances in his cab, so he was hauled away in cuffs. His truck was hauled away on a wrecker. I made a call after the commotion died down to the company safety director and informed them that their rig will be in an impound lot and their driver is going to jail over the not so legal stuff he had in his truck. She thanked me and said that he will definitely lose his job, especially over the alcohol and the other not so legal stuff. I guess he played the mess around and find out card and it bit him in his career. Am I the jerk for interrupting my son's date so he could pick up his sister? I'm a single father, 43, to two kids, Max, who's 17, and Liza, who's 8. I usually have Liza in after-school clubs so that I'm able to pick her up after work. However, last evening I was given some work that had me working overtime. I did try my best to negotiate out of it, but my manager told me that the assignment was to be completed by that night, so I just did it. It was nearing towards 6 p.m. and I knew I wouldn't be able to make it to Liza, so I called Max and asked him to pick her up. He responded by saying that he couldn't because he was on a date with his girlfriend for their six-month anniversary. I told him that I understood, but that I really needed him to get Liza and that I'd make it up to him for interrupting. He just angrily turned off the phone and I thought that while he was mad, he had just decided to go pick her up. 30 minutes later, I receive a call from Liza's school on where I was because the school was close to closing down and no one was there. Luckily, one of Liza's friend's mothers said that they'd drop her off and it was all good. However, I don't really like it when Liza goes off with that particular friend, not because of the friend, but because of the mother. She has this habit of asking math questions in the car that she knows Liza is unable to answer and then criticizes her over it. It's all just very mean. I called Max and asked him where he was and told him he was in big trouble when he got home. He just told me that he was busy and to leave him the heck alone. He came home at around 9 p.m. and I told him he was grounded and that he wasn't allowed to use the car for a good three weeks. At that, he got all mad and said that it wasn't his fault I was failing as a parent and unable to afford someone to collect Liza. Just want some insight on the situation. Was I being too harsh and am I the jerk for interrupting his date? Edit. This is the third time I've asked Max to pick up his sister in the span of a year and a half. Some people are asking why I don't have a nanny. Money is tight. Max and Liza's mother are not present in their lives. And no, I do not think of socializing myself with the parents at Liza's school. I'm at work most times, so I haven't found time outside of the yearly parent meetings. Please refrain from insulting my son. Not the jerk. You're not failing as a parent. You had to work overtime, not out drinking or messing around. Your son was in the wrong here for not helping turning the phone off and calling you out for it. But you two need to talk about this and discuss expectations. If you expect him to be part of the contingency plan, you need to be crystal clear on that and what happens to car privileges when he doesn't. Dad was at work. He didn't deliberately ruin son's date. It was an exceptional work-related situation and he needed son to step up as a family member to pick up sister. 
It seems dad does his best to let his son be free, with enrolling his daughter in all sorts of activities to help keep her busy until he finishes work. Son could have stepped up on this one. Not the jerk, dad, and good thing you grounded your son for his entitled behavior. Posts like this make me feel hopeless for us as a society, as a species. You'll get a ton of responses from people who haven't raised kids. Many still are kids, and they haven't been taught responsibility and family. Asking your son to help on an unexpected situation is not and should not be a problem. Your son's response is entitled and gross, honestly. While being disappointed at the interruption would be fine, even appropriate, hanging up on you is disrespectful and refusing to help is selfish and disgusting. Like societies, families only work when everyone contributes. Your son using your car is a privilege, not a right, and it's up to you to extend that privilege to him or not. The hanging up on you and the disrespectful way he spoke to you is all on its own enough reason to, at the very least, suspend that privilege. You do not have to tolerate disrespect, no matter how upset he was. Also, financial woes do not indicate how good or bad someone is at parenting, something your son is going to be painfully aware of very soon. If you give him money for allowance or anything else, help him learn by suspending that privilege as well. This is a teachable moment. Let him see there are consequences for his choices. Please, I implore you to ignore the ridiculous comments here that are characterizing asking for help as anything other than that. You should be able to ask your family for help, including your nearly grown son. Do not listen to anyone who says otherwise. There's a difference between asking for help in an unexpected pinch and forcing him to be a regular unpaid babysitter. Do not listen to this BS. You're not the jerk, and I hope you stick to your guns about your car privileges being suspended. His behavior was selfish and disrespectful, and he needs to experience consequences for that. Also, inform your employer that you have responsibilities at home that take precedence, and you require advance notice of any extra hours required or you won't be available. They cannot expect you to scramble to find childcare at the last possible moment. You're the jerk. Don't be surprised when your son goes no contact with you. Hate to break it to you, but your kid is your responsibility, not his. You can't make your son fulfill the role that you signed up for just because it's convenient for you. You're basically teaching him that he has to let people walk all over him in life. Is it okay for you to ask if he's available to pick her up? Sure. But if he says no, you need to learn to take no for an answer and stop being a controlling jerk. No refunds once you've stepped out of the store? Fine. I won't step out of the store. This happens in a large store in a European country. When you purchase something from them and for any reason want to return the item, their policy is that they never give money back. They only give you a voucher redeemable same day only. I went to the store today and I purchased quite a long list of items. I got home, my wife looks at them and says we don't need some of them. I go back to the store, barely 20 minutes passed. The returns manager smiles at me as I tell her I just purchased there and I would like to return them. She tells me that I stepped out of the store so she can't refund only gives me a voucher and that I must buy something else. I'd already bought everything I needed. Then she tells me to take the products home and keep them for the next time I would need to buy something. Then I can come and get the voucher and redeem it. Imagine keeping a pair of shoes in a bowl and remember to bring them with you the next time you happen to need something. I tried to reason, but she was adamant. Those are the rules. You stepped out of the store. You don't get a refund. And then it clicked. I asked, so, if someone wants to return an item without leaving the store, they get the money back? Yes. You see where this is heading. Malicious compliance kicks in. I ask to return the items and get the voucher. I take the voucher, go inside the store, find a product to exactly the same amount. I buy it with the voucher. Right after the cashier, there's the returns manager. Straight from the cashier, I go to her, hand her that random product I had just bought, and say, I would like to return this. I don't want it and I never left the store. She's looking at me with barely contained rage in her eyes. I kid you not. The awkward pause was getting longer and then the manager comes along, looks at us and I smile at him and say, I never left the store and I would like to get a refund for this please. He nods, silent and not looking at me, she proceeds to refund me the money in cash. Company policy, right? My mother ruined my life, so I made sure she ruined hers as well. My mother is a textbook narcissist. So when I, at the age of six, called my family crying because I knew something was wrong and she didn't love me, 
my mother decided to punish me for ruining her image. She spun this story to my family. I was a pathological liar and I was brainwashed by her mother to ruin her life. She effectively cut me off from my family and from the outside world and made sure I had no internet or cell phone access until I moved out. She prevented me from getting a job and tried sabotaging my efforts to get into college. I went through so much with her. When I was younger, I retaliated in immature ways. But as I got older, I was very, very careful with how I talked to her. I only ever told her the truth. Remember, she convinced herself that I was a pathological liar. So if I tell her the truth, she will now think whatever I said is only intended to hurt her. If I say, you should bring an umbrella today, it looks like rain, she will make a point to not bring one to spite me and get caught in the rain. If a friend said something similar to what I said and was genuinely trying to help her, my mom would think that person is her enemy and remove them from her life. She only has nasty people in her life since she's removed herself from everyone who cared. Some examples. I would tell her about her friends that were plotting behind her back. She didn't believe me and hung out with them even more. They put her name on the payment for an object she doesn't have and has to pay tens of thousands of dollars for. You can't say I didn't warn her. When she had job issues, I would tell her exactly what she was doing wrong and why people don't like working with angry, difficult people. She thought I was trying to hurt her, so she doubled down on her behavior. I hear she's fighting to keep her job. Would suck to be fired right before retirement. You can't say I didn't warn her. She called me looking for advice. She was basically going to fly across the country to go stalk someone, and I told her not to do that. He'll dislike her even more, and he could call the police. I got in touch with her dad and told him to try to stop her. She went because now she was convinced it would work. The poor guy was hiding in his workplace while she was outside crying for him to come outside. Can't say I didn't warn her. I hear she's in therapy now, but it doesn't seem to be working much. I can imagine why. It must be a very upsetting experience to have a professional tell you the same lies your pathological liar of a daughter told you. I think this is how you get someone with kindness. Am I the jerk for reneging on my wife and I's agreement? I, Pete, and my wife, Eve, have an agreement. The agreement says that if one of us has a complaint or suggestion that we want to voice to the other person, we have to preface it with at least two compliments. So for instance, if I wanted to approach my wife about leaving her dirty clothes on the floor, I might first tell her that I liked the new shirt she bought and that I appreciated how she did the laundry the previous week, and then I would ask her if she could pick her clothes up. Yesterday, Eve was making some oatmeal chocolate chip raisin cookies, a recipe that she makes often by stirring together an oatmeal cookie box mix with chocolate chips and raisins. I really dislike raisins, so naturally I've never cared for this recipe, and I've even strongly implied my dislike for them on a number of occasions, but my wife never seems to get the hint. So yesterday, while Eve was getting out the ingredients to make the cookies, I started with two compliments. I said that it was a nice gesture for her to make cookies for the family, and that I liked how she cooked them for the perfect amount of time so that they weren't too hard or too doughy. I then told her that I didn't care for the raisins and that I would appreciate if she made a few cookies without them, since the raisins aren't already mixed in. Eve adds them and the chocolate chips to the box mix. My wife nodded, so I thought that meant she was saying yes. Later, she announced that the cookies were ready to eat, so I came over and asked which ones didn't have raisins. With a confused expression on her face, she asked me what I meant. I reminded her of our conversation earlier. Eve replied that since I had given her two compliments on the cookies but only one complaint, she thought I enjoyed her raisin cookies more than I disliked them, so she continued with the original recipe. She said they couldn't be that bad if two-thirds of my comments about them were positive. I was at a loss, so I just sat down. I wanted to say something, but I didn't know how to articulate my thoughts. Finally, I decided to just go for it. Eve, I began. But before I could continue, Eve interrupted in a warning tone. Careful, Pete. Remember our agreement. At that point, I lost it. I stood up abruptly and told her I couldn't pretend anymore and that eating the raisin cookies like this was unbearable and that my feelings about the cookies were pretty much all negative. I didn't preface that comment with two positives, so I broke our agreement here. At first, I thought I was justified, but I talked to my friends who told me that my wife doesn't owe me cookies and I should just be grateful she made me cookies at all, and I shouldn't have broken the agreement. Eve is still mad at me. So, am I the jerk for breaking the agreement? If your agreement doesn't lead to clear communication and resolution, it's a bunk agreement. 
Your wife is weaponizing your agreement to essentially shut you up. Forced compliments aren't compliments. Yeah, this two compliments thing is a terrible idea. Those compliments would mean nothing to me if I knew they were forced just so that my husband could criticize something. It's way healthier to just compliment when you like something and have an honest discussion when something is bothering you. In this case, I think they're both being ridiculous, making this big of a deal about some cookies. It's super easy to make a couple of cookies without the raisins. Just scoop a few out and add raisins later. But it's also ridiculous to expect your wife to cater to your tastes when you've hinted at wanting them a different way and not just outright asked for a few cookies to be made without raisins. Holy cow, the communication in this relationship is abysmal. In what messed up world are you not allowed to share that you dislike raisins without offering two essentially unrelated complimentary preambles? This is so odd. Maybe well-intentioned to form more positive exchanges, but this feels really extreme and counterproductive to me. Not the jerk. Your wife failed to uphold her part of the agreement you'd made. Depending on your dynamic here, you're both kind of dumb or she's manipulative. Think about it this way. You're not allowed to voice a complaint unless it's prefaced by two compliments. But if you preface a complaint with two compliments, she then assumes the complaints don't apply. Magic. No complaints are ever made. I suggest you get to therapy to get some intense guidance on how to actually communicate in a partnership. Am I the jerk for telling my brother-in-law to prioritize his family over a Rolex? I'm 35. My brother-in-law, who's 37, is known for impulsively spending frivolously on things for himself and does not have the money for, most recently, a pizza oven, paddleboard, and other costly non-essentials. He very much tries to keep up with the Jones as well. Anything he gets is because he saw someone else buy it because it's trending. He's up to his eyeballs in debt, not making money at his commission job and currently fighting for his sobriety against a decade-long addiction that he successfully hid from his wife until a few years ago. I honestly believe his brain is stuck with impulsiveness, but he swears he doesn't need rehab or therapy to fix his issues. He has a nice truck with a $600 a month payment that his wife, my sister, who's 36, makes the payments on. Meanwhile, she drives herself and their baby around in the same car she's had since high school. It's not a good car and it doesn't even fit today's safety standards. Brother-in-law hits me up about wanting to buy a Rolex and wanted some advice about buying one. I sold them for a long time. At that point, I carefully worded my response and advised that luxury watches are for people who can afford them after everything else is taken care of and he needs to prioritize his family before buying one. I also mentioned that, in my experience, that people who can truly afford a Rolex could also flush the cost of one down the toilet and not be impacted even slightly, and that we aren't in that economic class of people. I've seen people overextend themselves on these watches just to be able to flex, and that's exactly what he's doing. I perhaps went too far by saying if he has money for a Rolex, then he has money to put his wife and baby in a safer car that was built in this century. He got upset because I didn't tell him what he wanted to hear but I meant what I said, and there is no one else there to save him from himself. His wife is trying to be very supportive of him and his recovery and usually goes along with his impulse buys because it reduces their fighting and the money isn't going towards something bad. It's not my business, but I worry for my little nephew and considerably less my sister who enables him. I'll accept the jerk designation if I crossed a line here. Not the jerk. You're doing absolutely the right thing and here's why. My late husband had exactly the same tendency towards reckless spending and also had an alcohol problem and other addictions. He sadly passed away in his 50s and it was only afterwards that I fully realized that his reckless spending and the other addictive behaviors are all linked and can be symptoms of depression and anxiety. They were all giving him the temporary hit that he needed to feel better in that moment but then made him feel even more depressed afterwards. Your brother-in-law might need some help with the same issues. My mother is demanding I adopt my niece and nephew. Myself, 26, and my partner, 32, are child-free and wish to remain so. Both of our families know this. Recently, my partner's brother and sister-in-law passed in an accident, leaving their son, who's 12, and their daughter, who's 9, behind. My partner's parents have been watching them for months, but they cannot do this full-time as they are both in their 70s and have bad health. My partner's sister has also declined adopting the pair as she and her husband are both paramedics and work evenings and weekends. Naturally, they came to us next 
and after weeks of discussion, my partner and I decided that we would not adopt them. We both know that we would make terrible guardians, which is the main reason we have decided to be child-free. My partner's family are understandably upset that nobody can take the kids, but they will now be adopted by family on their mother's side. This means they'll be a few hours drive from all of us. It's important to note here that my in-laws have been incredibly kind during this process, have not pressured us at all, and accepted immediately that we would not adopt them. My mother, on the other hand, has been on my back, saying I'm making a horrible decision and that I need to put the needs of the kids above my own. She has also been mentioning that my partner and I will finally have kids, despite me telling her that that is absolutely not the case. She has always resented the fact that I'm child-free and wish to remain so, and I'm worried that she's seen the kids as a way of becoming a grandmother. I feel terrible that we aren't adopting them, and I certainly feel like a jerk because of it, but it just wouldn't work out in the long run. I need to know, am I the jerk? Edit. Just for clarification, the kids will be going to their second cousin's house, who they are close with. They're not going into the system. Not the jerk. The kids are going to guardians who want them. It would be bad for them to be with someone who resented them, even more so if they were there because your mother wants grandbabies. Not the jerk. Your mother is not thinking about those kids' needs. She's thinking, yay, now I get grandkids and this will make them want more. Those kids are not going into the system. They're going to family who are capable of raising them. You and your partner knew that you weren't able to do the job of raising them and have made the right decision for those kids. Don't let anybody tell you differently. Am I the jerk for making a joke about my brother's affair at his wedding? When I was in elementary school, I was the type of kid who got disrupts class often on their report card, so I never focused much on school. My district had this system where they would pair high schoolers with younger kids to help them with school, etc., and my mom made me do that after I kept getting in trouble. So my tutor was a freshman, Abby. She would come to our house after school to help me with my homework or something. I barely remember. My brother, John, was the same age as Abby, so they would talk to each other and ended up dating. She stopped tutoring me officially after like a month, but since she was at our house a lot, I also talked to Abby a lot, and we were close as well. Fast forward 10 years, Abby and John got married and had a kid together. Five years later, John tells me that he's getting a divorce because he's met someone new. It sucked because I liked John and Abby together a lot, but whatever. Then he tells me he had had an affair with his new girlfriend. Also sucks, and I told him he shouldn't have hurt Abby like that, but whatever. I also asked Abby how she was doing, and she wasn't doing well, but she told me she didn't want her to be the reason I have a bad relationship with my brother. However, two months before the wedding, Abby calls me and tells me that my brother's girlfriend has been harassing her nonstop. She showed me the texts, and his girlfriend was saying some pretty disturbing things about how she's so much better than Abby, taunting Abby for having to share custody of her kid now, etc., just making fun of her and bullying her. I told my brother about this, and he said he would ask his girlfriend about it. A month later, I asked him if he ever brought it up, and he said he did, but saw nothing wrong with the texts, which upset me. I confirmed that he saw the same texts I saw. Abby apologized for involving me in the whole thing in the first place and encouraged me to still go to the wedding, where my brother asked me to make a speech. The speech went well until I made a joke. The gist of the joke was me turning to his new wife and telling her that if she's learned anything from this, she should know that my brother will never let his wife stop him from finding the love of his life. This got my brother and his wife really mad and they kicked me out shortly after, and my brother has been calling and texting me nonstop yelling at me. Am I the jerk? You know how vigilantes are technically in the wrong, but we all cheer them on anyway? You're the jerk, but high five. Don't want to work on our assignment? Fine, neither do I. This happened a few years ago in college. I had a class about entrepreneur projects, and that semester was building a business on paper. Basically, we had to figure out what the business would be about, how it would work, and how much money it would need and make. I did this subject in a different class so I could have Fridays free, so I didn't know anyone in there except for one guy. Let's call him Mark. So I teamed up with Mark and three other leftover people to be in our group. At first, things were working like a charm, since we only cared about passing the subject and didn't care about our grades. We would each do a part on an assignment. We had to deliver assignments each Wednesday, but we still got max scores on them. 
our grade would basically be based upon all of our deliveries plus some points on individual tests. Important info for later. Didn't take much time for things to go downhill. It reached a point on the project that basically we couldn't modulate the work anymore. The five of us would need to sit together and brainstorm about the next steps, more specifically when we reached the point of how we would earn money with our business. Either that or one person would do everything alone. My group chose the second option and this would basically be happening for six weeks. On Friday, I would send a message on our WhatsApp group like, guys, we have to deliver this stuff on Wednesday. When do you want to meet? Saturday, no responses. Sunday, the two checks would turn blue, meaning everyone read the message. No response. Monday, I would send a follow-up message. No response. Tuesday, I would work hard and deliver it alone. Wednesday, two hours before the deadline, someone, usually Mark, would send a message. Hey, how do you guys want to do it? Which I would answer, it's already done. And they would thank me and promise to release me from doing anything on the next assignment, which wouldn't happen and the cycle would continue. After five weeks, I was fed up and got in contact with the teacher. Her response was that it was too late to do anything now because she couldn't assign me to another group and she couldn't give me special treatment. But she told me to check my grades because most likely I already passed the subject. I looked on it and with my individual tests plus what I had already delivered on the project, I got a grade high enough to barely pass the subject. This was kind of messed up, but all the individual tests and project as well, grades were public. So I saw that no one in my group had passed. The closest one was Mark, but he didn't deliver one of the individual tests, so he would still need to do something to pass. I could then and there be the bigger person and say something like, guys, I already passed the subject. Start doing something or I won't do anything anymore. But I can be petty sometimes. On the sixth week, I didn't do anything. Wednesday arrived and Mark tagged me in the group asking if I did anything. I remained silent. Panic started arising. Group members texting me in private. I removed the blue scene icon in my WhatsApp and would read the messages in airplane mode so they wouldn't see me online when reading. Except for the group messages, because they would see that I read them regardless of leaving that setting on or off, so I didn't read them. Apparently, when you don't do anything related to the project in five weeks, it's hard to figure out what to do next. Deadline passes, I go to sleep. Class was at nights, at distance because of lockdown. Wake up the next day, several name callings, assignment not delivered and the group threatening to report me to the teacher. My answer was simple, teacher is already aware. I'm not doing anyone's work other than mine, you can all buzz off, and left the group. At the end of the semester, only Mark and I passed. They got their crap together in the end, but not enough for the other deadweights to pass. Was the sweetest six, grades here go from zero to 10, six is the bare minimum to pass, I ever got. Mark never talked to me again, but it was for the best. Support our channel by joining as a member today, and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.